So um, I'm Jen Shore. I am the Executive Director of Focus for Health, and I wanted to thank everybody for calling in today. The full bios of our panelists are available with all of the materials, so I'm not going to use valuable time by going into deep detail. These are a group of amazing ladies who are also Focus for Health grantees who are helping us educate and advocate about prevention of childhood sexual abuse. We have Trigil Wade, who is the executive director of America's Big Sister, who focuses on mentorship. We have Carol DeVore, who is with Safe Harbor, who provides supervised visitation, it has a history of DV um, work, and is well connected to what the needs of teens and um, are who are dealing with these issues. And we also have with us Sherry Carney, who has been in this field for such a long time. She's the executive director of War as One, and she has been a tireless advocate for changes to laws that will protect survivors of childhood sex abuse. We have wanted to do more than just fund organizations. We have wanted to get the message out as aggressively and as loudly as possible that we cannot continue to live in a society that allows children to be harmed. When we were talking, I think we all came to the collective understanding that most of the information about childhood sex abuse focuses on institutional abuse. It focuses on stranger danger. And regrettably, as we have all found um, in our work and some in our personal lives, that one of the areas that this occurs most frequently is in families, and it's with close family, friend, people in our inner circle. So we decided to start with the uncomfortable topic first, and that's why we decided to discuss when sexual abuse occurs in families. So I apologize, this is gonna be a difficult topic for some people. Um, I want to give everyone an appropriate warning that some of the things that we talk about, though it won't be sensationalized, it might be difficult for children to hear, so please be mindful of your surroundings. And I'm going to now turn it over briefly to Laura, who is our media person, to give us a two minute discussion on what we need to know about how to use Zoom and mute ourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> it'll be even less than that. Um, as most of the attendees have figured out, they're, they're coming in muted and, and without the video. Um, so, you know, we won't have that distraction. Um, but if you do have a question, right where everyone's chatting and, and uh, dropping where they're, where they're from and their organizations. Welcome everyone. Um, that's where you can put a question in. Um, I'm gonna try to keep, uh, keep up with it as best I can, um, as is Jen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible as they, they pop up. And um, the webinar is recorded, so we will be sharing this afterwards and disseminating it on our social media pages. Um, so, um, so we'll have that. And I believe that is my piece. So I'm kicking it back. <laughs> Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to the panelists. I might jump in uh, to moderate as need be. I also want to let you know that I am going to be ending the discussion at five minutes to the hour. If people would like to stay on at that point and engage in a question and answer through putting the question in the chat and direct it directly towards one of the panelists, we can spend about 15 minutes after the actual town hall to answer questions as need be. But now at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry Carney, who is really the impetus for us starting this. So thank you for putting pressure on me to do something. And um, it's nice to see it come to fruition. With that, I turn it over to you, Sherry. Thank you. Yeah, my specialty is putting pressure on everyone, the system, the courts, the legislature. Thank you for having me and thank you to Focus for Health. We're very grateful to you. Um, I just wanted to say to everyone, we are the shamed and the silenced. We are the victims of child sexual abuse and we are you. So by saying that, I thought I came from the perfect family. I thought that every family uh, beat their children, burned them with cigarettes, and were emotionally and physically abusive. Um, what I didn't know was the rest of my story because I had repressed all memory. Uh, coming from what I thought was a perfect family, went on to high school, normal high school, uh, normal law school, other than being sexually assaulted my first week by a professor at law school. Um, graduated law school, took my first job. I was doing aviation law and a social worker came into my office and said, I would like some help. I have a case of a child we suspect is being sexually abused at home on visitations during the weekends by her 
her father. It was a very amicable divorce. I said, sounds great, not my field. I feel terrible for this child, but I really don't want to get into this sort of sordid family, dirty secrets. And she blew up and said, what is it with all you lawyers? You women don't want to help anyone else. You don't want to get involved. Just, she guilted me into it. And in my religion, there's something called tikkun olam, which means to heal the world. So I was very open to guilt, as many Catholics are, Muslims are, and every other faith is. So I, she said, just come meet the child. I said, where is the child? She said, the child is at McLaren Hall. McLaren Hall in Los Angeles is baby jail. It is dangerous. It had barbed wire fences, um, horrible situation for a three-year-old little baby girl. The medical evidence said that the child had vaginal scarring, anal scarring that could only have come from a sexual assault. I still didn't want to take the case, but I met the child. I walked down McLaren Hall, inmates are spitting and urinating on me. And I looked down the hall and I see this little girl. She's blonde. She's rocking a one-eyed teddy bear. She's crying. I picked her up and I said, I'm going to make this better for you. And that commitment to this child changed my journey in my entire life. I picked the child up. I held her. I asked the social worker I would take the case if she got her out of jail ASAP the next morning. Took the case, my first child sexual abuse case, started cross-examining the accused uh, and the accuser. And when I cross-examined the accused, he's a good-looking guy, six foot two, played soccer, very charming, winking at the judge, started cross-examining him, asked me if he'd ever touched his daughter's genitals. He didn't know what the word touch meant. I started getting angrier and angrier, and I kept thinking I heard typing sounds. And I kept saying to the judge, is anyone typing? Is the court reporter typing? The judge called the next courtroom. No one was typing. I hear these typing sounds. I think I'm losing my mind. I'm getting angrier and angrier. The judge tells me to step back. He tells me to knock it off. He tells me he doesn't like my behavior and I don't hear anything. I am just going through this space of flashing things coming into my mind. And I think it's Katie's case. I cross-examine the defendant. He says, finally admits he knows what the word touch meant. I said, for what possible reason did you touch your daughter's genitals? I said, was it 20 times, 200 times, 2 million times? And he said, about 200 times. And I said, for what possible reason could you touch this child's genitals at three years old? I did it to medicate her. When he said that, I cracked. I jumped across the witness stand, attempted to strangle him. I got uh, arrested for contempt of court. Uh, the bailiffs came running over. They dragged me out kicking and screaming. The judge said it was the most unprofessional conduct he had ever seen in his lifetime. I did serve two nights in jail. The judge called me to his chambers and he said, uh, I will give you three choices. I can begin to ask the state bar to begin disbarment proceedings. I can hold you in contempt of court for at least another 18 months. And if anybody remembers Elizabeth Loftus, she was held for contempt for that long. He said, or you can go into court or to therapy. I apologized. He made me write a uh, uh, bend on the knee, kiss the ring to the perpetrator, how sorry I was, uh, how I'd acted inappropriately. The first three drafts he hated. Finally, by the fifth draft, he agreed to let me go to court ordered therapy. I go to court ordered therapy. I don't think I need it. I think I have a regular kind of American family. And in the process of therapy, I uncover the most horrendous memories of being sexually abused by my father from infancy to about four years old, being raped by another family member and neighborhood children in a gang rape. Um, I then remember more of the abuse from my mother um, and it destroys my life while it also gives me a chance at a life that is not filled with silence and it's not filled with shame. So I decide to have a confrontation session that the therapist arranged with my parents to confront them on this and to see if my parents would take responsibility. Um, I then, so I have this confrontation session with my parents. My mother's a social worker and a therapist. She immediately comes in, says, I want the credentials of the therapist. I want to know, I am your colleague here. I am not your patient here. I want to know what you have to say. So she comes out swinging like a Perry Mason. 
And my father comes in quietly. I finally confront them both. My mother says, it couldn't have been your father. It had to be someone else. My father jumps up and says, this is outrageous. I never touched you. Um, it, it goes from bad to worse. And then I begin to describe to my mother my father's hands and what it is like to be the object of sexual encounters with him. And it is then that she begins to cry hysterically and leaves the room. And that changed the trajectory of my life because no one in my family took responsibility. So I began to be a spokesperson for child sexual abuse, and I represented children who were sexually abused in the home, like Jennifer mentioned. And honestly, I was never able to save a single child from child sexual abuse in the home, no matter how good a lawyer I was, no matter how much evidence we had. Judges didn't want to believe it. They never denied the father custody. They may have had a suspended visitation, or they may have had court ordered monitor visitations, but ultimately all of the perpetrators got their children back and most of them continued to sexually abuse. So then I began to represent teenagers because I figured they were a little bit stronger, but they weren't. But here's the problem. As I became more of an advocate, I was asked on a television show, a national television show, and I was one of the first people in the United States to mention the word incest. And they had a psychiatrist on the show who said to me, I'm so sorry for you, Miss Carney, but the truth of the matter is you're one in one million. And then I told him my religious background and he said, oh, you're one in three million. So I not only felt that my parents didn't care about me, that I was completely silenced, ashamed and alone, but I felt that God had abandoned me and that God hated me too. And it was both paralyzing and enraging and so I could have either done what a lot of victims do, which is to stay silent and withdraw, or I could come out and just light that match to the gasoline that was already burning inside of me. And I decided to light the match. And so I went on national television and what started to happen is that survivors were calling me saying that happened to me too. You're the only person that's talking about it. Will you take my case? And after a hundred calls of me saying, I'm sorry, I can't take your case because you are past the statute of limitations and the statute of limitations for civil cases in the state of California at the time was you had to sue by your 19th birthday. Your statute was told or stopped for one year. So some clients had till they were 19. Well, my clients were 23, 24, 25, 35, 40. And every case I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm sorry, I can't help you. And finally I said, I'm sorry, I'm sick of saying I'm sorry. And so I changed the law after five years of work with a law partner who was wonderful in California to extend the statute of limitations for survivors of sexual abuse. So that instead of they had to their 19th birthday, they had an automatic right to sue until they were 26. And then three years from the date of discovery of psychological damages due to the childhood sexual abuse. The problem with that is I then helped 40 states pass that law and what I'll address later is how that law is old and that law is no longer good and that we need more changes. And so that's basically my story in a nutshell. I went from victim and I decided that healing for me wasn't just therapeutic personal healing, but it was healing others and it was healing others by helping survivors get justice. And I don't think that we should suffer what we've suffered and have courthouse doors slammed on us and say, sorry, you're too late, too bad, while the predator gets a license to perpetrate on many children. And as most of you know, and many of you are victims, you may not be your predator's only victim, and he or she may not have just victimized you once, and nobody stopped them, and nobody helped you, and nobody's had a voice. And so today is about inspiring your voice, inspiring you to speak up, inspiring law changes. And these other fine panelists all have a perspective on what happened to them as well. Thank you, Sherry. I think what is very clear in your story for all of the people who are critical of this issue who say, 
Why didn't the child say anything? Why doesn't the victim come forward? I think your story and unfortunately most of the others are a perfect example of why people are uncomfortable coming forward. Um, so we're gonna shift gears and talk about kind of that disclosure and the prevalence and um, the need to believe victims. And I think everyone who's been through this experience walks away with a sense of what they wish they had heard. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Trigel because one of the roles that you have as the executive director of um, America's Big Sister is you really work with teens and you mentor and you do a lot to prevent at-risk girls from becoming trafficked because we all know that when there's sexual abuse in the home, you're at risk for so many other things. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, Focus for Health. And of course, Jen, love you. Share your story is amazing. Uh, I think it's a one of the stories and the topics that we all our heart beats fast just listening to listening to them today, you know. Uh, but I'm grateful for this safe space, this safe space, and that's definitely one of the things that we have to create. We have to create safe space just safe environments for our young people. We got to let them know that we're here for them. Uh, we got to cut away the, uh, the, the thought that, listen, you know, we, no subject, all subjects are at the table and we got to keep these subjects at the table. And it is that important for our young people. I know that while we have in the discussions um, of, you know, the sexual assault, it, you know, there's no lines there, right? We, it, it crosses economical, it crosses racial, we know that it crosses all these guidelines, but there are some um, barriers and concerns in certain areas, and particularly the ones that I uh, deal with are, are colored, are colored girls, and, and me, black girl, just excited about life, um, finding them, you know, and the barriers that they end up going through, and so um, particularly financial being a barrier that they find themselves in. Um, I know personally, just from, you know, telling the story, story of even my life, I found myself in a barrier where financially there was a need for us to eat. It was a need for us to have meals on the table. And um, I, you know, my story, I think my family story has been written. I don't know if anybody have um, read it, but there's this family story that's been placed out there, but there's this one part of the story that no one ever hears about. And it was the abusive space that I found myself in. Um, you can read a story, um, Father first, how my life became bigger than basketball. You'll read all about our life, but Tregill disappears at 15 years of age. And Tregill disappears at 15 years of age because she's left at home with her mom now, a heroin addict on drugs. Things are going on um, around the home. And so because of that, she's now incarcerated. And now the cover is gone over the child. We have a lot of young people where they don't have the covering over their lives. And now we're finding them being so vulnerable and they're the most vulnerable in these disparity spaces. And so I have now a family member uh, that is over me. And now the family member comes and say, hey, you have to use what people need and want and they'll give you finances for it. And I say, well, no, I'm 15 years old. I don't want to do that. I just want to cheer. I just want to be in school. I just want to be excited. And I'm sharing a story. Let me be clear. It's a story that I don't talk about much, but it is the story that we, I, the reason why America's Big Sister is in existence because it's, it's that time of my life when I had no one. Um, and then the shame of you know, telling anybody that now I have a family member, to, and I still say family member, you hear that, right? Because if I say who the right. family members are, now we're left in a different conversation. So this is a family member that says, you're going to have to do that. It's not an option since you're now in my custody, since your mom is no longer here, you're going to have to do this. Now there's this arrangement that happens between the person, the abuser and the family member and the arrangement now has something to do with finances. And the finances is you now have to take care, you have to bring dollars, you have to do this. I don't know what all was discussed. I just knew that, listen, it was, I had to do something and I had to now use my body in order to now be able to provide just for food on the table. And so these are these impacts that happens over your, over, over your life. And as a young person, you don't know, well, you're just doing what you were told to do. Because if you say anything and if you tell anybody, you're showing up, I have to show up at school every day. You have teenagers showing up to every school 
just every day looking like nothing is wrong. I had to show up every single time. The abuser, how about, became even more abusive because now the abuser began to beat you. So now you're in a fear because, again, the things you don't want to do, you have to do. So now this abuser began to be someone that put guns to my head. You know, they begin to now take full control over who you are and you cannot move. You cannot go. I know we talk about the sex trafficking space and most times when we discuss it, we look at it as, as a... Uh, you know, a form where you're trafficking and you're sleeping with all types of men. I want people to just kind of even look at this form that I have to now be coerced to now give a sexual act to someone for fine for finances in the home. It's the same thing. And now we're finding ourselves have now I have to sleep with this one individual. It's, I'm not trafficked. I'm now with this individual. So now he's giving and taking all the control out of the hands of the family member. And once that happens, now you are left with nothing. Here's where we have an African American have a problem with is what's done in the house stays in the house. That is a term that I wish they shove it so far far away from the world because it has no room to live. What's done in a house stays in a house is the reason why most of us, I would say, in the African-American family have stayed quiet. We've stayed quiet because this is just the rule. There's two rules. One is religion and one is loyalty. And that's absolutely insane. And this is also the thing where they tell us a second comment is pray about it. You know, you go and tell them this is the problem. Pray about it. These are two phrases that that African-American families have had to live with and keep on going through life. So that's the reason why we don't get the medical help and the, the mental, we're in mental health, health awareness month now. We are not getting the assistance we need because of these tragic things that is happening in our lives. I'm grateful today, of course, that I'm able to tell the story, but there are so many of our young people are not being able to tell these stories. And this is why we as organization, as I believe mentorship absolutely opens up that door because now you have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to talk to the young person to hear their conversations so let them know they don't need to be ashamed they don't have no reason to be ashamed it is okay i didn't find that out until i got older to be able to open up my mouth and most times that's when i hear it i hear it after they turn 18 and they out of their family's households we don't hear it when they're young but we got to be able to know our signs when they are away and they don't want to talk to anyone. There's different signs when they, they want to push themselves aside, even the ones that are promiscuous. Uh, that's a sign that they have done something and they awaken their sexual space. There's signs that we just have to be careful of and we have to ask the question instead of waiting for them. I'm sorry, put them to the side. I, I want to talk to you about something. And here is where the conversation started. I've noticed this about you and I care. Right. And so that is we and we can keep talking. I know I have a time period here, um, but I definitely want to turn it back over to you, Jen, and having, you know, continuing in these conversations about this uh, sexual assault space. Jigel, thank you so much. Your, your story is touching. And I think, you know, your, your point about where was Jigel? we as women face that. We face it in our homes. We face this in our personal lives. You know, we become Victims become invisible and it's not by accident, it's by design because we don't want to confront these things. Money and inequality of women play a huge role in this. You know, you talk about the finances as sexuality being the only commercial asset that some women can bring to their families. That's a reality. The other issue is you have parents who, or you have parents who might know about abuse in their home, but because of the financial implication of turning in that abuser, they do not do that. They would rather send their 16 year old daughter out of the house for being a liar than to admit that what happened happened and have to confront that because the financial implication, the social implication, you know, you say um, in families, what happens in this house stays in that house. It's, it's no different than Penn State or the Boy Scouts. For whatever reason, as soon as someone alleges allegation of abuse, sexual abuse, the whole entity reconfigures to hide that abuse and protect the integrity of that entity as opposed to dealing with it and healing the child. So with that, I'm gonna to segue to Carol. Carol DeVore is with Safe Harbor and she unfortunately has one of the jobs of dealing with the aftermath. Um, as a court appointed supervisor, Carol frequently deals with families when they are going through this. 
There are multiple victims. You certainly have the person who is the victim of the abuse, but what she will probably be able to attest to is there's an entire dynamic of victimization and the family, the siblings, everybody in that family entity is, is somehow suffers because of this as well. So with that, Carol, I'm gonna ask you to, to talk about your experience and what you see. Sure, thanks, Jen, and thanks, Focus for Health. So I have a all-volunteer nonprofit agency in a very um, wealthy little area called Flemington, New Jersey. So things don't happen here. However, things do happen here, and I've lived here all my life that I am a survivor of domestic abuse as well as sexual abuse. And after years of coming to terms with what had happened with me and trying to heal through my trauma, I began working at a domestic violence agency, volunteering and then becoming a legal advocate. And I sat in court as people were getting restraining orders or talking to judges. I thought somewhere in all of this, judges are not hearing anything about the children. They never see the children. They never see the full dynamics of what's going on in the family. So I'm thinking, what can I do that? So everything I tried never got to the root of all this. I've been a special ed teacher. I worked at a drug rehab. So I saw a lot of the kids who've been sexually assaulted and turned to drugs. And I got the idea of doing this court-ordered supervised parenting time, which I did do for four years. Now it's my own agency. And it has morphed into so much more than that. And Trujillo, you really hit on that about the mentorship. Safe Harbor, the name could be more perfect. It literally is a safe harbor. So it began as a place, and until we got a little money together, and through the help of Focus for Health, I was able to um, rent a space that had really turned into a very trauma-sensitive center. When you walk in, you just feel you want to kick your shoes off, you want to just sit down on the couch and be free. So we started out just doing, and not just, but doing the supervised visitation, and I thought, wait, I'm not just a high-class babysitter. There is so much more depth going on here. If I'm supposed to just sit there and observe, which is what we're told to do, and not to talk out of line about supervised visitation network, but that's basically what they see our role as being. Um, there was so much more. And I see the children's pain. And what started happening is at the end of the visit, the children didn't want to leave. And again, I'm writing reports to the court. And I'm thinking, well, if I just put child cried, showed, you know, uh, demonstrated that she did not or he did not want to leave, I'm thinking, no, they don't want to leave, not the parent that's visiting. They don't want to leave me. They don't want to leave Safe Harbor. They literally finally found this place that was safe, that they never knew that feeling existed. So now, of course, the Jewish guilt starts up and saying, oh, my God, now I've made them know what safety feels like. How do we keep that going? Where Now where do we take that? So through that, I started doing what was just called a children. We just called it free play. Children could come and play. We call it now change for children. And the children who were coming for supervised visits started coming and just hanging out and being free at the center. And then teens started coming. We had, um, in the last two years, six of our young people died by suicide. So uh, students started hearing about that and they started coming to Safe Harbor. We started doing a lot of awareness about mental health and um, just really getting out into the community. And the, especially the team saw that there was so little acceptance of so much and they had, they didn't have a voice. So there were things going on in the high school that they didn't feel they were being heard. So I said, okay, how do we step by step get heard? Can't get in the front door, back door, side door. We'll go through a window, whatever way we can get in, take little steps. And that's where we began. So as Jill was talking about a mentorship, I was going to do a kind of formalized mentorship until I realized that now with COVID backing off a little in New Jersey, I was open, able to open the doors again for some of our children to come. And if I can tell you, I started last Monday. People heard. I had to, I won't turn people away, but we had to divide things up. But the children who are coming, today I had 10 children. I had to move them all around because we couldn't have that many in the place. But a teen who I'd never met before asked if she could stay after, and we talked. And it turned out that she has a friend who moved in with her. It was from another country. So I said, me and my naivety still, even doing all this work, I said, oh, you took in a foreign exchange student? No. Somebody from our local high school who parents get them out, and it's a step-parent. And I, in my head, after doing all this work for so long, I'm thinking, yep, there's sexual abuse going on. Sure enough, a step-brother. And so when we're talking about the families, we have that whole, we're always talking about, uh-oh, the step-father, the step-uncle, the step-grandparent. But I'm seeing more and more of the step-sibling going on. 
So you can't do that. Mommy finally got married to this nice man. What are you going to do? Mess now this relationship up? And now we're not going to have money. We just got finally this nice house. We're going to go out. We're going to have to go back and live in the apartment that we really didn't like. So all these things. So through Safe Harbor, I think I've connected with all. I think I'm the only person who gets to see all family members because I get to see the, the person who's got to visit the child, then the, the custodial parent, as well as all these other groups. And we just, we're, we're missing out on so much. No more stranger dangers. Jen started at the very beginning. I won't even use that because we know that the majority, it's not the stranger, it is that person in the house, that person we've trusted. And the kids tell me I have a large LGBTQ community that come to me and they've been able to open up about what their needs are, some of the things that happened to them along the way. Can I take that pain all away from them? Certainly not. Can I erase that pain? Certainly not. But can I give them their voice and finally be heard and figure out a way maybe together that they can talk to their family? Last night, I had two teens who had to come and see their father. And the girl, she's 16, and she was so bright. There had been a domestic violence situation. And the girl kept saying to the father, you don't even know me. You don't, what, how do you tell people, what do you tell people about me? Well, that you love softball and you're such a good student. He said, such things who, what I do. Who am I, father? She kept yelling at him. Who am I, father? You can't tell me who I am. Have we ever sat down and had a meal together? No. He says, well, you know, I don't like to watch TV. Like, who cares? About she says, I don't care about TV. Then he asks, how's the driving going? I don't, want, I don't want to talk about driving. I want to talk about the real meat and potatoes. So I feel what we've been able to create, what I have, and it's, I'm kind of a lone, lone person there, but so through that mentorship program, I have become that the gram in the community, that house in the community where people can come to. Uh, we had a recent case that um, a family was coming and the child told his, out here we call him DCP and P, so the child, you know, um, worker, and he said, I'm going to see Miss Carol tonight. And the mom said, yeah, we're going to go over and see Miss Carol. I'm taking some donations to her. Dyfus worker calls me, doesn't ask the direct question. I kept saying, what, what is your question to me? They were very concerned that I was um, not being professional enough and that the child, because he referred to it as Miss Carol, who was coming to my home. And I said, they call it Miss Carol's because it is a home situation. What, we have to call it Safe Harbor? We have to call it a place? So all of that that's coming out, I think, is helping children handle some of that trauma, move forward. But I am watching families that just, let's get, let it go away, go off to college. Um, let's just let it be for right now. The first and foremost, we have to believe, and I think Jen said about we have to ask those questions. If something doesn't seem quite right, if, if we're off on the wrong track, we're all on the wrong track. That's all, but at least they can say that we've asked, and you'll get the response. You'll kind of know they're not ready to talk about it yet. Um, we also do therapeutic visitation, which sadly I don't think is going as well as the supervised visits because I think the children just have a different feeling when they're in the center doing the supervised visits. So we do have a long way to go, but I know out here, at least my community has embraced it. Um, they don't know all that goes on at Safe Harbor. They think little babies get to come and play, so they're very good about donating things. But I think we are beginning to um, make some headway, at least for our young people, to know that they have a safe place to go, literally a safe harbor to come to, which is so important. Thanks, Carol. You're, you're absolutely right. And um, so we're getting into the last 20 minutes of this discussion. And um, this is, I'm going to switch, switch gears on everybody. So we all agree that Childhood sexual abuse is one of the most outrageous things that happen. I don't think you would have anyone who would come forward and say, oh, I take a counter argument to that. But yet, despite the fact that this is happening with such tremendous prevalence, and all of the three ladies on the panel will be able to address this, we are seeing that people who commit this crime are not feeling the shame, are not seeing the consequences, and are not getting punished. The victims are holding all of it, but all too often, the people who are the perpetrators get away with very little consequences. Carol is doing oversight of these visits because even with an allegation or even a um, conviction of sexual abuse, parents still have access to sometimes their victims and other times the other siblings. Jen, so, can I chime in for a second, Jen? Yes. With that, may I chime in? And Jen is absolutely right. I had a family that the two oldest girls had said that their father had done something to them as well as their mother. The oldest girl stayed, you know, 
kept to her thing, met with the prosecutors, the younger of the two teens recanted her story. Because she recanted, she had to come and have visitation with her mother and father. The dad was found guilty, has to do six years in prison. Do you think that family will ever, those two girls will ever be close again? You know, and the older one wasn't holding her sister to say, you know, oh, look, you, you left me during all this. But if the older sister was going to take it, why should the other girl put herself out there? It was easier to say, not easier, but she wasn't ready. So she knew that the father was still going to have to do but she had to come for supervised visits. And can I jump in, Carol, here? And so what we're all talking about here is a, a legal system, a family court system that is not broken. It was designed this way. It was designed this way so that women don't have a voice, children don't have a voice. Women who speak up for their children are taken, deprived of custody. They are punished. Perpetrators, I had a case of a perpetrator. He was supposed to get 60 years. He got 60 days. The judge listened to the mother saying the children need a father. So the point is all of you, you know, safe harbors, what you do to jail are incredible interventions, focus for help. What we're doing at Roar is One is trying to catch the victims who didn't get justice in the family courts, who didn't get justice when they were children, who want justice now as adults. Because if you don't get them at the beginning and the middle, we have to have some justice for them at some point. And we know we need profound legal changes. So what Rora's One is doing is taking all those children that you see, Carol, that Tradil deals with, that you deal with, Jen, and try to extend the statute of limitations to eliminate it. The statute of limitations, Roars One says, throughout the United States should be obsolete. Statutes and limitations for child sexual abuse should be like bleeding and leeches was in the 19th century. We don't have a statute for rape. We don't have one for murder. We don't have one for torture. We don't have one for treason. We don't have one for embezzlement. We do have statutes for child sexual abuse. That needs to end. So while I appreciate and honor you women who are doing this incredible on the ground work, we're trying to do the work that happens when the system fails the children and they're still left at 25, 26, 30 years old with suicidal thoughts, with PTSD, with economic issues, with right to work issues, with mental health issues. Women of color are uniquely punished. They are the most likely to be sexually abused, the least likely to come forward, and the least likely to get justice. So this is an issue that affects all of us. I am so grateful all of you are at the intervention prevention stages. That gives me hope. And I'm the catch at the end if, we, if victims slip through. But I don't know how many victims are out there that have tried to find lawyers, tried to get justice, tried to be believed. So Roar's One believes silence no more, justice for survivors. So we're hopefully, as a team, all of us, gonna catch these predators at some point. Either the family law court with Tradil, and Tradil made a great point. People say that they're victims of incest or child sexual abuse. We are sex trafficked in our own homes by our own family members. That's what child sexual abuse is. Because it's someone you know, and because it's a family member, doesn't mean you're not groomed and doesn't mean you were not trafficked. It just happens at home. And Trujillo made another wonderful point, which is same thing that all children hear. What goes on in this family stays in this family. And Carol, in your situation, family members that break that silence get punished. Yes. Yep. And so we're dealing with a system with an entire culture. This is like the, 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 the sexism movement, the racism movement, and the child sexual abuse movement are all sides of the same coin. It's all white patriarchal male power over women and children to have them how they want them, when they want them, to beat them, sexually abuse them, child sexually abuse them, rape them, violate them. That is the system that we as a team of women and doers and the whole public needs to do a national movement. This is beyond all of us individually. And I, I kiss you all for the boots on the ground work you are doing 
blessed you. Bless Trujillo. Bless you, Jen. I mean, thank you, Carol. But if that doesn't work, we need to have a hammer at the end. Yeah. And I think that the, we get the hammer at the end. I think we get, we, we, we work together. I talk yeah. about before, we got the, we got like a pyramid. We have a grassroots that's going to cover a lot, but then we have that leadership, that, that space where politicians and everyone can, now we have to work together. Then you have that top part. That top part is more of a marketing thing. Let us make a more noise about this conversation. Let us create, I don't care, subliminal com messages that'll come up on your television while you're watching the football game and letting our young people know that we're here for us. There's these three levels, and I believe we all can operate in those levels, which is why everyone that even is on this call today, we all come together in this space because even when we catch them, we still have, even, and I'll use the family space, even when we catch them, and I have one of my young girls who, you know, her uncle did years in jail, but when he came home, they celebrated him. His, her, my and everyone in that house was happy to see him. They was hugging on him. They isolated this young lady. So she can't, she go to family functions in the most uncomfortable space still today. All and because she I wasn't invited. I, I became the black sheep, just like you're saying. I was the one, not my perpetrators. I didn't get invited to Christmas. I didn't get invited to Thanksgiving. I was shunned. I was the, the outsider. I was banned. So the person who speaks up, like you mentioned, gets punished by the family as well. So the question is, how do we change this culture? And what it makes me, you know, you know, so upset is that there are more victims of child sexual abuse than there are COVID-19 victims, more victims and victims with cancer or LGBTQ or any other social issue. It's not that those issues aren't fantastic. It's that this is the only elephant in the room that is not getting a national movement. The time has come. So anyone listening to this call, all of you, please join all of us. And thank you, dear God, for Focus for Health and for Barry. You, Jen, are just an angel that has saved so many of us and put this issue on the front burner for the first time. Thank you. And Trujill, you're so right. It takes all of us. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please continue. It's okay. No, it's just, I, I mean, if I had to add anything else, listen, as a community, we got to create accountability and we have to create openness and we have to be able to educate ourselves. We have to educate ourselves as a family as to what do we do in these moments? What do we do in these times? I mean, those are my three takeaways that I'll tell all of us to, you know, get on top of each one of the communities that we're in is to create accountability for us. So when it's happening, we all are against this predator it's too it's just it's just a crazy how they get away with it all but we all are against it and we are speaking against it i even know some of its generational curses there is generational spaces when it comes to it so even when you we research our um our predators we'll find that they even receive that same type of action with their family or their fathers um this this is a generational curse that just has to stop it's and I believe this leaves a tattoo on a survivor, a handprint that crosses five generations, like you said. You don't even need to sexually abuse a child to have another child in the family witness it and be forever traumatized by it for the rest of their life, or be the daughter of a survivor who's overly protective, who feels that every person coming into the family is a danger to this child. This is a pandemic. This is a huge pandemic. And so, you know, my takeaway is for victims to know that they are, you are not alone. We are with you. We stand with you. We believe you. Everything you're saying is right. And as Trajil said, we to this day can't mention our perpetrators' names. The only reason I can mention two of them is I have a signed release. I mean, how crazy is that? And so, you know, the answer is from today forward, we make big changes. We get this done. We get Congress to pass and eliminate statutes of limitation across the United States. Maine has no statute, criminal or civil, for child sexual abuse. Why should where you live depend on justice? Why should geography determine justice? Why should families of color be more susceptible, least likely to talk? This is part of Black Lives Matter. This is part of the racial conversation. If you're a Native American child, there's about an 80% chance of child sexual violence. 
We're looking right now across the whole population. One in three girls, one in five boys are victims of child sexual abuse before the age of 18. This is all of us. Boys are there, yep. This is and a woman or child or victim every 92 seconds. We've been talking maybe 45 minutes. We've left maybe 35 victims are sexually abused right now, assaulted, battered, raped, while we've had this just town hall. Yeah, and, and every nine minutes is for the child. So as we see the, you know, the picture of us all, you know, the assault, but even every nine minutes, a child mm -hmm. is, and right. so. Is, is absolutely a problem. And, you know, just like I said, knowing those signs, uh, one of the things I, you know, correlation to this space of once a person has got assaulted, we'll find suicide. Uh, and I know that's a, com a conversation that we, we haven't quite mentioned, and I know it's way deeper uh, to get into that space, but that's a sign when you see young people um, not wanting to be here any longer. And that was, that was me. I tried to commit suicide on three different occasions at the age of 16, all because I that if this is life, I don't want it no more. Right, that, and why would you? Why, you, what stage you? Not to, I don't want it anymore. And I, um, and I'm grateful that I, that it did not happen because my, you know, in the life, you, you, you'll see the deck and it came and it passed. And um, I swear I'll be here all day on how I got through that time in my life. But knowing, you know, that's a, a sign. We, when you see young people, and I always believe in them journaling and things, if you hear them talking about suicide, that's another conversation to have. You see them with disorders and eating disorder. It's a conversation to have every single time. It's okay to have the conversation. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Promiscuity, a child who uses her sexuality because that's what's paid off her. That's what's gotten her attention. That's all she thinks she's worth. I mean, there's a million signs, depression, um, cutting, um, alcoholism, drug abuse, drug addiction, acting out. And in my case, I didn't do those things because my mother would have beaten me if I did it. <laughs> I <laughs> Self-blame too. Self-blame is another one. You start believe believing that you put You're it on. Fault. Yeah, you did it yourself. You, you dressed a certain way and you did this, but I'm gonna tell you now, there is nothing to, for anyone to, to, to violate you in that way. You are not at fault. Your voice matters. We are listening. We are gonna be silent no more. Enough is enough. So I'm going to jump in because we're, we're running in a little bit on the time. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions coming in and people are talking about what can be done. I know we're talking about civil court and statute of limitations. Um, education is critical for prosecutor's office, for child protective services. Just like people do not want to talk about sexual abuse when it occurs in families, prosecutors do not want to take these cases. Right. Children do not make good witnesses because of the way their brains work to protect them when they are assaulted and in traumatic situations, their brains actually allow them not to take in the information that the prosecutors need to prove what's happened. The way, um, I, I think I always kind of assumed that things would be recorded and there would be transcripts. Children have to take the stand in most states, regardless of their age, and be in the room with the person who assaulted them. Right. For that and numerous other reasons, 90% of child sex abuse cases are resolved at the plea level. That comes with very little consequence to the perpetrator. The message is clear. Do not tell. We don't want to hear it. And if you do, right. you will be more punished Correct. than the perpetrator. Even in our small town, when cases come up, when someone is arrested for abusing someone, what the prosecutor's office will typically say is, Parents and mothers need to stay more vigilant about these matters. They do not say the perpetrators will be held accountable to the largest right. extent of the law. Until that narrative changes and the focus is not on the mothers and the children right. for, for preventing it. And we are very clear that people who commit these crimes, we take very seriously and they will go to jail very little is going to change. So I, I, sorry if I sound a little hostile about this because we're asking questions about how to make things change. But unfortunately, the change is at the hands of the people who seem very committed to this continuing. So, so one idea I do have for change that's written into the uh, Carney USOL is a separate sexual assault court 
where the court personnel are trained, the, the judges are trained, the prosecutors are trained and educated, the, the court clerk is educated. Some of this is lack of education, Jen, and some of it is like the sex domestic violence courts in 18 states have been very successful. We need a sexual assault or child sexual abuse, similar court of trained personnel Everything you said is completely correct, and then some. And so I don't think we can fix the current system because I think it was designed that way. We need to design a new system. I agree. And even in cases of family court, I think anytime there's a situation where there is an allegation or a conviction of a sexual abuse, whether the perpetrator is the, the father or the mother, there needs to be intensive case management. There needs to be a different level of intervention because for one lawyer who is the judge to make a decision of something of that magnitude that can change the trajectory of a child's life and healing is too much power for one person, either if it's through a panel involving social workers. There has to be, to your point, point Sherry, it doesn't have to be modified. It needs to be started over. <laughs> it has to be redeveloped from the beginning because it, it, is, it is designed this way. So um, I think we are at the, the 3, 3.55 Eastern Standard Time. I want to, we, we were going to continue with question and answers. I have a lot of questions here, so we're going to get to those. But I want to kind of just say thank you to everybody for participating. Thank you for the information. I was nervous about this for no reason. Um, it exceeded my expectations. Thank you, ladies, for your information and your stories. Um, as, as awful it is to tell our stories, it's critical to ma make them more normalized and make this a part of everyday conversations. Ladies, you're amazing. I am happy to know you all. I consider you all friends and family, and I love you all. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask some questions that came in from the panelists. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming in and all of our um, other grantees and board members and everyone who called in today and supports what we do. Thank you, everyone. So the first question that came in, and this has been my question as well, Sherry. I wanted to ask you this since I've known you. Um, where is your relationship with your family now? I watched your movie and I saw your relationship with your sister and I've always meant to ask, are you and your sister still close? Where's your family today? You know, it's a painful question even after all this time. It's the question I get asked the most. Both of my parents have passed away. My father on his deathbed, uh, when I held him in my arms at 82 pounds, said he was sorry. I said, are you sorry for the sexual abuse? He said, Sherry, I'm sorry and he died two days later. My mother, um, two months before the movie, after the movie came out, I got a letter from my mother and it, I had it, it read, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't a good mother, I take responsibility, can we ever have a relationship? As I'm reading the letter being a, a sassafras attorney, I said this must be a deathbed confession because my mother would never admit to any of this. I get a call at two in the morning, my mother died, uh, she was on life support on a life support machine. I never had a chance to talk to her. I never had a chance to say, yeah, let's give it another chance or no, I don't think it's going to work out. My sister and I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds because I have family members that have changed their last name so they don't have my last name um, because of all that's come out. Um, it's, it, it's a fraught relationship. We both try, but I think it's irretrievably broken to some extent. And the relationship with my other sibling, I don't have any communication with them at all. And it stands today that I am still the one that uh, helped destroy the family. And I have lost my family. I don't have a family. I have a family of Focus for Health. I have a family with Tradil. I have a family with my husband. I have a family with my friends and, uh, you know, and the family of my choosing, but my family of origin is gone. I, I'm sorry to hear that, and um, that's not surprising. It's just part of the way that reinforces to victims that coming forward is is too painful and too difficult. Um, so that needs to change. Um, I'm going to jump to another question, and I thank you for for your honesty, Sherry. That's a, that was a tough one. Um, in order to is there a way to get help if you need help in saving children in a situation from a parent who has been abusive and has time protected by custody orders? 
Um, I can personally say, I don't know how, but I would love to hear from someone, Carol, you deal with this all the time, and I'm assuming the answer is a hard, there's very little that you can do. Very little. And we've had this conversation so many times, Jen, and we are saying that it's sad that the, um, you know, we have a victim and a perpetrator, a victim. Um, the victim has so much more that they have to explain in a way. And if you're too emotional in the eyes of the court, oh, you're unhinged. And if you're not emotional, oh, this is all a money thing. I'm working very hard. Um, the court system here, I think I'm in enough that they have some respect for me. So they will hear me. But it was interesting during the pandemic, I'd never done Zoom visits. So I did with the family that was going through a lot of, it's just horrific. They had adopted children. So I won't get into the story, but so we, we tape recorded the Zoom visit. And when I sent it to the court, I said, would you also like to have my written report? And their answer was yes. Now to me, what more could I write in a written report than you could see on that video? And I knew it was because they weren't going to take the time to watch an hour video, but before court, they will be able to skim the report and do something. So I am, I send little articles. I do go three times, well, four times a year to, we have a vicinage of three courts that I do go and I get, I'm able to present. So I try to give things to the judges to make them just think a little bit about some of the decision. Um, we got a long way to go. I, I would, I'm a pretty positive person. I don't know that I'll see the change in my lifetime, but I'm damn well trying. <laughs> That's all I can say. Sherry, do you want to try that question? Is there something that you think can be, what, what would you, advice would you give a mother who wanted to protect their kids? Um, I can only speak to the statistics. The statistics are not in the favor of the mother. Um, my understanding that is in many of uh, 70% of the cases where a mother alleges abuse by a spouse, and, and let me rephrase that, there are, there are certainly women abusers out there. So when a protective parent makes an allegation of abuse, um, in, in 70 to 80% of the cases, the custody goes to the abuser, not the, the parent who's trying to protect them. What, what advice do you give, Sherry, to parents? You know, it's a difficult question, Jen, because we tell mothers, see something, say something. We blame mothers, and it's primarily mothers or stepmothers or aunts, that if they see sexual abuse, they need to take action. But when they take action, they get punished. They get punished by losing custody. They get punished by being called a bitter divorcee. They get punished for all the reasons Carol talked about. Um, I don't, the only upside of this is that as a child whose mother did nothing, I do think you can keep the relationship with your child by showing that child on a daily basis that you believe them, you care, and you're taking action. I do have fellow attorneys who are successful, who are strong, who are powerful, who are able to protect children and mothers that report the childhood sexual abuse. It completely depends on your legal representation, how good they are. And I want to ch chime in with what Trujillo is saying, which is the more expensive the legal representative is, the tendency for them to be higher acting, higher, higher visibility in the courts, more respected by judges, larger law firms. My suggestion to my attorney colleagues out there is to encourage your big law firm to take more of these cases pro bono for women and those trying to protect children who are losing custody. For mothers, you're in a catch-22. If you do nothing, your child will never forgive you. If you do something, you're likely to lose custody of your child anyway. I just think that women, primarily women, are an impossible situation. And that's why I want to work on redesigning a different court system that isn't putting the life of an entire family in the hands of one very busy individual judge who may or may not understand or be competent enough to decide the entire outcome of our childhood, our motherhood, our families. It's a crazy way to do things. You're absolutely right. And um, I appreciate the answer and I agree with you. I think we all have an uphill battle and um, these conversations are important. Um, I know we're talking about the legal system. Um, the things that we do have control over are our responses when our children disclose to us things though. And um, I think the 
I think everybody here and Sherry, I think you really spoke to it um, the, the best. The damage that occurs to you personally when you're not believed. Um, most victims who are in childhood when it's occurring do not come forward. The reason that they give retrospectively is they're afraid they're not going to be believed. Um, when they tell, that is usually reinforced to them when they are not believed, and that seems to be a source of a lot of the psychological, emotional damage that occurs. So. I'm going to throw this out there. I know Carol might want to answer, but um, if anybody else would like to as well, I know we say believe victims, believe victims, believe victims. How do you support victims, especially knowing that not all of them are going to disclose to you? How do you create therapeutic interventions that help even if a person does not disclose? Carol, you want to shoot first? I just think my, like I said, my program has organically grown um, by just having the safe place and people starting to come and recognize that. So I think I have given the victims, which I hate to refer to as victims, but I guess there is no other word for it. Um, survivors. Know, what's it? Survivors, true. Or and, Hopefully. Uh, and what happens, I do believe in all of this though, you're right, because I felt when I was going through my my own domestic violence ordeal. I think so many of our programs, and Jen, we've talked about this, so many of our programs that get us to be survivors, but don't we really want to become thrivers? And that's where I try to get the kids that I'm working with. If I can get them at a young age, when I get them, when I see the four-year-old little boy hiding under the table because daddy's voice has changed an octave when he's at a visitation, what do I do to make him feel safe? When he asks me for a Band-Aid, sure he can have a Band-Aid because for a four-year-old, the Band-Aid makes boo-boos go away. He can't, he's not articulating what really happened in that home. So I do think by having that safe space, letting them know what does really feeling safe because as we've talked all along, especially with children, do they really know that there's abuse going on? We know later on, but at the time, Sherry, when, as we said, you didn't realize you know, did we block it? Do we even know that it's abuse when it's our parents? It's normal. So, right. So that's what life is like in this family. Yeah. So it keeps going. So I just think by, and like I said, the little girl comes in, well, now I've showed him what safety feels like, but I'm sending him back home. But at least right. you know, I've even given children this little, it's a battery operated candle, but they like, they put, turn that candle on and they just think of safe harbor and remember that feeling, stay together and you're going to come back real soon. Um, but it's a very fine line of, you know, of making sure that the parents will continue to bring them back as well. Let me ask you something. Is your state a one taping consent or a two taping consent? In other words, can one party one. tape something? One, yes. Yeah. Well, the next thing you might be able to give a teenager some kind of microphone or recording device or camera mm -hmm. um, to show what's going on in the family. Mm -hmm. I, I think if those resources were available, uh, right. when children were children during when I was a child, some of us or some people would have used them. So if they're old enough, have them turn their phone on and yeah. tape daddy losing his cookies, yeah. you know, beating yeah. one of the children, talking about sexual services they want. I mean, because the courts only look at evidence. Yep. Yep. They only look at what you can prove. This is an area that goes on in secrecy and silence. Mm -hmm. So we've got to up our game on proof. Yeah. And there's a new app out called Victim's Voice by Sherry Curtical for domestic violence survivors that encodes the, the, the domestic violence. The survivors can record it. It is blocked. She doesn't keep it on her server. They don't have it on their phones. The courts, when time comes, can unlock the device. No one is tampered with it. Those are the kind of answers we need. Mm -hmm. Technology needs to help us. Mm -hmm. We cannot expect a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old to have any safety if we don't give tools to those children. And I hate to say it, but we need technology. If, if, if the Silicon Valley wants to do something mm -hmm. that's really wonderful for children and for families, help us with this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. You, you guys are right. I'm going to go for one more question. Uh, they're, they're coming in. So um, this is from another uh, grantee of ours. What about system change that incorporates real restorative and or transformative justice options? Just a thought. Has anyone seen any success with that? I think by, your, by our silence, um, 
I have a friend of mine that does restorative justice and I have not seen restorative justice work unless the perpetrator is willing to make real changes and is willing to admit that something is wrong here. And if the, the violator can do that, I think restorative justice is an option. Have I personally seen it work? No. But Anyone my, else? My concern would be that we deal with so many professionals who are really not well informed about this area to um, undertake something that would be that sensitive with the victim and the perpetrator in the same room, unless they are extraordinarily skilled, I could see that being um, almost disastrous. I also think it cannot be a replacement for legal justice if that's a direction that's going because conversations that can come out in that process could be used against the victim if there were any legal proceedings. So um, correct. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a wonderful idea and it could be a source of healing for some victims, but I would imagine that that would have to be farther along in people's process than um, while the abuse is just ending or um, if the family is still actively in the wound with it. I think restorative justice comes after legal justice and after therapeutic intervention. It cannot be a first step because just what you said, Jen, I confronted my family as an adult and it was devastating. And so I think what you said is exactly right. It may be stage three or four, it is not stage one. It's, it's a very important for time to, you know, kind of heal a little bit more um, to even help the person, you know, come out of the fear. So there's a level of fear that um, surrounds any victim. And I believe that fear stops them from being able to articulate, communicate, and even understand to the fullest to be able to even, you know, translate that. And, and I know time had definitely worked even in my position. Um, I know my mom was prepared to lose me in order to put me to safety. So I would like to even see some of our um, you know, some of the like homes even, you know, brought up for some of our victims to go to. Um, so when it is happening, they get to a safe place. So my, I, I had a, a family member that was in uh, California. And so uh, my, my mom, when she, once she, you know, got out of jail, she was clean. Um, first thing was, let's get you into a safe place. So I, uprooted me out of high school straight to a different city didn't know anyone had no clue but she was prepared to lose me uh and and deal with the predator and the fear because i kept telling her he's gonna kill you oh she he's gonna have to kill me then um and so having us stand so strong in some of these predators faces but giving ourselves that time um is is necessary and so i was able to come back two years later um not the first year because i still lived in such a fear it actually took me two years to come back um and, and have the conversation with the um the abuser and let me ask you this to jill how did you feel about your mother sending you away at the time when you were a teen did you feel abandoned or did you feel that she was protecting you it was a, a level of protection that um I would say um, unknown because it, it's, it's a level of protection that's higher than the average, you know, protection of, of the book. But to say no longer will a person lay their hands on you, even if I have to uh, lay, you know, my situation was my mom had to lay her body over me as the man was beating me um, to try to get me to a safe place. But she had to use her body to, to lay over me and, and get me into a safe place. So she, you know, she also... Um, had to feel that abuse. But again, she was maybe one week out of prison and, and was clean enough to get me free for that for that time period. So what I will say uh, to some some of those that are looking uh, or listening, um, let us get our young people into a, a safe space and a safe place. And there are some family members that will take them on, that will, you know, bring them on. And then we begin to educate that person. So we cannot leave the, you know, now we educate them on here. When you have an abuser in your home, here's what you would abuse child in your home. Here's what you need to look for. There's going to be some crying nights. It's going to be some of these moments. You need to be there. Are you even talking about like shelters for children? Like we have shelters for domestic violence victims, but if you're a kid, there's no place to go. I was 16 years, I was 17 years of age. I landed in San Diego, California 
first thing my aunt did was take me to a domestic violence space saying, hey, do you guys have any help for her? They says, no. They say she could shop in the little store we have here. I mean, we sorry, but we don't have anything of that nature. So what I'm, I do know is they're going to, you know, we, we're going to have to raise up and have some kind of place. So they didn't have any place for me to stay to get the help to, to protect me. Because even with my name, it was going to be like, can we do a name change for a little while? So we can protect this child from being even not found in the system. So the school system had to be notified. Everyone had to be notified that I was in a, a very fearful situation um, to finish off my senior year in high school. Wow. And, and you know, what you're saying is exactly why when they do interviews and statistics about the number of kids who are runaways who came from situations of, of abusive families, um, you know, you, you can just imagine the scenarios. A, a child says that this is happening in their home, the family doesn't believe and they have nowhere to go. So they end up as runaways. So um, what you're saying is, is critical that there needs to be a safety net in, in governments or in society for these individuals to get go to a safe place. Foster care hasn't seemed to meet that need in the way we've hoped it would. Um, so maybe something more modeled after domestic violence shelters. Um, so those are all really good suggestions. Um, I think it, in order to wrap up, I, I think if everyone could just give their one line or the most important thing we need to do, um, I think my one line, if I had to pick, would be we need to believe our children when they tell us things. Trujil, what would your parting one, one line be? Is having these frank discussions that would, you know, prevent the silence and to, you know, the secrecy and eliminating that um, is definitely going to be a change in our in moving forward. And if we got to march, we don't have to march. We're going to have to do something uh, that is, um, you know, that's something that hasn't been done before. Absolutely. Carol? We need to believe and we need to keep discussing. We do, we do have to let kids know that it exists out there and there are places that they can talk. It's not um, an anomaly. There are many that are going through it also. Absolutely, and Sherry, I, I think you summed it up best. You are not one in a million. You are a part of, unfortunately, a huge number of people who've had to live through this. You have paved the way for so many kids and adults to get justice through what you have done. You have been in this movement. I know it did not, wasn't your choice that came to you, but um, the, the impact that you've made in this space and what you've done for people is immeasurable. I'm honored to know you. I, I loved, you know, it, it was painful to watch the movie. I wish I could have reached in and, and made your mother say what she should have said. And that was that she believed you. What, what can you say to the rest of us as a takeaway? You know, where we've been crushed, we come together and have a voice and roar as one. And that we end all statutes of limitations for child sexual abuse. And we create a system that is fair to mothers and protective parents and children. And we need a national movement. Unfortunately, because I'm a lawyer, I can never just have one sentence, right? Thank you for what you've said about me, Jen. It's been, it's very touching to me. You're gonna make me cry, but thank you so much. I feel like so much has to be done that I, I just have to live to be a hundred <laughs> to help everyone coming up that's doing great things. It's, and we're doing them now. So I, this was so wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Um, thank you to all of our partners who, who stayed on for the Q&A. Um, this is going to be a series that we do. I know a lot of our grantees have wanted to do, we're already planning the next one. So we're going to keep this conversation out there. Thank you for starting with the toughest topic first. It's all uphill from here. And um, thank you, ladies, again. Um, I will be in touch with all of you. And thank you to all of the people who took an hour and 15 minutes out of their day. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.